Okay, so just a reminder, this is the Augur meeting, and uh, we follow the Chaos Code of Conduct, which is Code of Code, Chaos Code of Conduct, which is basically, you know, be good or be excellent to each other. It's very um, basic, but uh, sometimes necessary. And um, this is our first time in this new time slot, so welcome everybody uh, who is here. Um, Victor, welcome. Just putting the minute stock in there. And um, Jamie, do you want to start with your agenda item first, or do you want me to lead off with the things that I have in there? Uh, I'm happy to, or I'm happy for you to kick off. Yeah, why don't, you, uh, why don't we kick it off with your stuff, because I can chat forever. Um, and I'll you, either I can share my screen or you can share your screen, whichever you prefer. <laughs> Um, I'll share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, let's go through a little bit more. So, um, should be able to do that. There we go. Yep. Cool. So, hi, I'm Jamie. Um, I popped into the Slack a week or so ago. Um, yeah. So, um, thanks for but, saying about this. I actually had a work meeting clash with this, but luckily, because of the time zone changes this week, um, I managed to get to both of them. Uh, which was good. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've been um, working on an open source project called Dependency Management Data. Um, and as part of that, one of the things I'm doing is trying to provide better visibility of the open source people use. Um, so one of the key things around it is basically take your repos, parse it, get a load of information around like, what open source projects are you using, then being able to get information around like are you using dependencies that are wildly out of date or end of life um are you possibly using things that your organization doesn't want you to use you can have custom ruling in there um and something i've been recently thinking about is um the ability to add like the ability to say which of my projects are looking for funding as a way mm -hmm. of making that more visible in companies um, but also possibly using Augur's um, like public infrastructure or privately hosted to get more information around projects um, and maybe surface things like you're heavily dependent on this project, but there is currently an open SSF scorecard of minus 500. Um, there has been one contributor in the last 20 years um, and stuff like that to try and surface <laughs> Maybe you should do something to help this project out. Um, so I guess the question is like, how would we best to go around doing that? Does it make sense to use the public instances? Would it need to be something set up purposefully? So um, I can let uh, Andrew pipe in with what he thinks. Um, when it comes to scorecard, um, you can run score like scorecard gets run uh, by GitHub if the owner sets it up. We Augur does run scorecard against a, each repository that it clones. That data is not currently available through a public API. So we would need to either create a public API or in the in the meantime, set up a separate instance that you have full access to. And you then could query the scorecard data. You can also identify files that are part of a project or not in that way. Um, so scorecard, um, was it funding YAML? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, so just on the scorecards, um, so I realize at least OpenSSF scorecards, they do have a public API for that. Um, yes, they do. So yep. I'd probably be happy using that if it's not currently available. Um, yeah, it's kind of just looking at, um, like, is there information around this project's looking for funding? Um, and also, are there any other, like, community um, metrics that could be of use to visualize for these sorts of things? I, certainly, there are a lot of metrics available. And I think, um, like, obviously, these are, these, these are the ones on the Augur front page because these are the ones that are most frequently asked for by projects that are wanting to understand their health after initial launch. So, 
you know, knowing how new contributors are taken up and incorporated into the project or not, and knowing that's kind of a, I would call that a following metric, like that kind of follows the zeitgeist of the project. If that project is doing a good job greeting newcomers, then you're likely to see a higher rate of uh, contributors not being drive-bys and actually being sustained contributors. If, uh, and then on the below that, our pull request uh, response rate uh, reports. These I would call leading reports insofar as these are the reports people ask for when they want to understand if they're being responsive enough to pull requests, because we know that from a lot of research and experience that if a pull request is ignored for a long time, especially from a first time contributor, then that person is far less likely to engage in the project on a, on a long term basis. So these are the reports that are in the auger front end. We also, of course, have the um, eight knot version of auger of a front end to auger. Um, where you can actually add your own repos once we fix something about that that's not working right now. Um, sometime in the last week, we broke some of that stuff, but we're in the process of fixing it. And that is located here. But you can get an idea from the metrics.chaos.io link that I just dropped in the chat that... Um, there, that's a dash plotly front end to auger that is under the OSS dash Aspen project on GitHub. And um, like if you click contributions, uh, for example, or contributors or affiliation or chaos, there's actual graphs um, under there. And this, yeah, it takes a minute to load on a public instance. I need to fix the version of the thing on there. I, uh, I've been using the latest version of dev from that project. And there's a couple of really long running queries that they've incorporated into dev that are, are turned off in, in main. So I should probably fix that um, note to self. So would this allow me to take yeah. basically any public project that may not have already been onboarded? Yeah. And, once once yeah, we uh, have the login sign up fixed, mm -hmm. you can actually create an account on Augur on uh, ai.chaos.io, and mm -hmm. um, this is this is just going to take you there to do that. Um, so you, and then you can actually add any repos or repo groups uh, or basically GitHub orgs or. GitHub repos and put them in your own group. Um, like I said, I just discovered today that for some reason we broke somehow we broke that. So we are we are working on fixing it actively. And I think Andrew has a pretty good beat on what needs to be fixed. I don't know if I'm right about that, but my sense from chat is we do. You do. Yeah, there's a yeah, I think between Isaac and I we have a pretty good sense on it. So yeah, I will I will make a note um, in the Augur Slack channel on Chaos Slack about that. Nice, that's really useful. Um, and I guess so. If I were to say onboard um, several repos, is it fine for me to be um, like querying it via the API, or yeah, is it API probably API queries are fine. Hmm. And I think um, that the questions that you might run into, you might have interest in data that is available in the database, but not opened up through API. And mm -hmm. what would be helpful for Augur is one of two things. If you're not, I mean, it's certainly a one of the things in the chaos software report is that all of our software is non-trivially not easy to install. Uh, it's not just Augur, it's all of it. And so we're working on making it easier and it's certainly easier than it used to be. However, um, so you could either add a, you could create a pull request where you create the APIs and um, I could walk through that with you on a separate chat um, if you want, or you could open an issue indicating the API that 
you want to have for mm -hmm. and for what data. Um, so you can see that the open SSF score, you know, I've told you the open SSF scorecard mm -hmm. is contained in the database. Um, and I think, you know, knowing that you may have you may want data there. If you want to get out the project.yaml file, uh, both of those would be new A API endpoints to request. Mm -hmm. um, nice. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I think that answers um, all the questions I had around that. So appreciate that. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Um, uh, Victor, I don't know if, um, so I guess we didn't, nobody actually knows each other. So I'm Sean. I'm one of the maintainers. Um, over here is Andrew. And uh, I've been with the Chaos Project for the full life of it. I was one of the co-founders. And uh, Augur is a piece of software that was created because as a research, I'm a professor at the University of Missouri. Um, from a research perspective, I wanted data that I was confident and could trust and get quickly. So Augur sort of satisfies my needs as a researcher and also satisfies the needs of a lot of uh, basically OSPOs that want to get a lot of data really fast. Augur is, um, it's, there's nothing that the Chaos Project has that retrieves repo data faster. Um, like Augur is probably at least 10 times faster than the other software, uh, especially above a thousand repos. Um, I would say, you know, if you're dealing with a hundred or so repos, any of the tools are pretty equivalent. But if you're over a thousand, then um, Augur, that's where Augur's sweet spot is. You had also asked about uh, libraries and dependencies, Jamie, and that just. Yeah, so um, the project that I'm working on does a lot of that for you. Um, so it gets all that information. Um, this is more about taking those and adding extra data that Olga has. Yeah, and um, the other, we do have a Libier table so we calculate uh, for every project the dependencies that are identifiable through code crawling, right? Like, so if somebody puts it in in a weird way or an unconventional way, we're not going to catch that. Um, but we catch anything entered in a conventional way and calculate Libiers on it. And so the Libier table would be one way, say, if you have a portfolio of 1,000 or 10,000 projects and you want to see which libraries you're most dependent on across those projects. That's where we have the data organized uh, to help answer that question. You may already have that infrastructure and I'm curious to learn a bit about it actually, because you know if there's something we don't have to maintain, I'm not against uh, experimenting. Yeah, definitely. Happy to chat separately or now if you'd like. Yeah, can, can you tell us a little bit more about your, your tool? It sounds like a command line tool, obviously. Yeah, so um, in fact, let me reshut my screen again. Um, so um, yeah, the the key thing is it's a command line tool um, that you, for instance, um, you set up a little SQLite database, you import a load of data into it, um, and then you can query it as an SQL database. Um, the thing here is like, how do you actually get that data? Um, so, so what's just try... what's what's happening here? Sorry. So um, this is um, one of the examples of. Oh, it's a it's a video. Okay. All Sorry. Right. Yes. Like, yes. It's a I thought I was like, is this, yeah. is this a web and web embedded terminal or what's <laughs> okay. Got it. Sorry, yeah. Um, so this is no, no. I'm um, following now. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the getting started examples. So, um, if we what was it data collection patterns? So there's a big look flowchart of various different ways that you can get the data, um, which I won't go into all of it. Um, but the key thing is, um, like for a lot of people, they're using a like software composition analysis. SCA oh, yeah. platform like Sneak, uh, Mend, insert vendor name here. Um, so yeah. a lot of people already have that data. Some people just use like the GitHub and GitLab 
um, built-in stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and my recommendation is using Renovate, the open source tool um, that does dependency updates and everything. Mm -hmm. But I've added a little wrapper on top of that that just like gives you a big JSON blob of here are all the packages I've discovered. Um, so it does a lot of the work for you. Um, and it's a case of importing that data into the SQLite database, for instance, running a command oh. like that. Um, and then that gives you at least the state of the repository as whatever tool that's grabbed the data understands. Um, but a lot of the time that doesn't show like transitive dependencies and a lot of other information. Right. Um, so in terms of this. Yeah. yeah, that whole hierarchy of things that are dependent on other things, the, the chain of yeah. nesting can get pretty ridiculous. Exactly. And dependent on, say, for instance, we're using Renovate. Renovate doesn't support like full transitive lookups for everything. Um, so depending on how Renovate supports it as well, you may not have the data. So yep. primarily using things like depths.dev, which is a Google service. Yeah, um, they just opened up the API earlier this year. Yes. Um, nice. I jumped on that immediately because it allows you to do some really useful things. Um, and yeah, look up um, stuff, including things like license information. Um, and so the idea is you take the data, um, you can do things like add ownership information. So in the organizations I've had it deployed, it's been really useful to be able to ask things like, which of our services are running end of life software and give me the names of all the teams so I can go and talk to them and work with them to get things updated. Um, and so for instance, this then has a web app that um, deploys the data set SQLite UI. So you have just raw database access to craft whatever fun queries you want, um, as well as some inbuilt queries that are built into the command line and the web app um, for surfacing things like how many CVEs am I affected by? What end of life software am I using? Um, and as well, like where yeah. am I using libraries that my organization may not want? Um, so yeah, that primarily uses um, depths.dev and end of life .date. You can't see I'm that. Not even familiar um, end of life .date. It's amazing. Beautiful. Since I've since I've found it, I have tried to put as much stuff as I can in it. Um, so they regularly update the data. There's a lot of automation behind it. But this gives you a really handy way of saying, okay, I've got MySQL running. What versions are supported and until yeah. when? Um, they've got a really great API for it and everything. Um, so you're using that and a few other means. Um, mm -hmm. helping gives visibility over some of the data. Um, so I try and offset as much of the hard work to either vendors, open source tooling, um, and then take that data and try and present it in a way that um, other people can then do more interesting queries on top of it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I wasn't aware of end of life dot data. I hadn't seen that. That has not come up in any of my many conversations about open source health. So that's an entirely new one for me. That's pretty cool, actually. Especially at the, um, I mean, these are really like uh, infrastructure level packages, most of these things, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like most library owners actually declare end of life or support <laughs> windows. Yes. Yeah. Because they don't. <laughs> yep. And so, for instance, inject, like, yeah. I was yes. going to say, they just inject breaking changes at will. Yep. Um, and so, one of the things I've been trying to do as well as that is um, so, there's the concept of advisories, which basically say, here's a way of flagging the package that is in use has something. Not necessarily wrong with it, but something that may cause your organization to be like, mm, maybe we shouldn't be using it. 
Um, you can yeah. do things like flag custom reasons why like the package is unmaintained. So even if the maintainer hasn't said it is unmaintained, you can. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then similarly, like yeah. with some of the um, metrics that or when the project provide, it may be able to say, um, and like with the uh, openness of scorecards, it's like, well, this project hasn't been updated in three years. It may be unmaintained, or it may just be feature complete, but yeah. maybe you my, should have a look at that. Yeah. My heuristic is unmaintained for one year. I kind of want to dig around and know why, if it's important to me. Not maintained for mm -hmm. two years. I definitely need to look around, not maintain for three years. This thing is abandoned because software moves to like, there's very little that doesn't require updating over a three year period. Honestly, there's very little that doesn't require maintenance in a single year. Um, but there are things. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for, uh, so that, yeah, I think this is, Real interesting from a dependency perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, Augur does sort of, um, I would, I compared to the tools that you're showing us here, Jamie, I think Augur is much more of a, I don't know, what's the word, brute force kind of a app, kind of a system where we just get it all. Um, and then it's maintained in a database. So, we don't just have um, the uh, open SSF scorecard. We have the open SSF scorecard every time we've run it. So uh, like under, I can uh, scorecard. Oh, no, I can't find it. Repo depth scorecard. So, yeah. I just uh, sort of sending by repo ID here. You'll see that, like, what, the repo one is Augur. And you can see that uh, the scorecard has been run this many times against Augur. Um, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. Oh, this is the most recent scorecard. Actually, I thought we ran it. Well, maybe I'm wrong about how it's getting run right now. It's uh, definitely getting the aggregate scores here. Um, so, and it's got the details. I thought I, I thought we were keeping a record of every single scorecard run, but maybe I'm mistaken. I'll have to have, ask Isaac about that. Yeah, so this is each test on scorecard and um, lib year. Oh, uh, here's, I guess it's the Libier one where we're keeping every version. Oh, wait a minute. I just didn't, re I just realized now that you were only seeing part of the screen because I have a split screen. So yeah, that's a uh, scorecard. And then like for the Libier ID, uh, I have to scroll over here. Yeah, so you can see like there's data collection dates for like Augur and Alembic and each of these. Oops, I went past Alembic. So like 1.81 is the latest and that was run on 1028. But we've got other ones going all the way back to April of this year on that. So that data is kept around. Um, and then this dependencies one is 
effectively just identifying the name of the dependencies and this runs every time the system runs. Um, and so there's data collection. I was going to say, have you seen um, something called ecosystems? I have not. I've dropped a link in the chat and in the meeting notes. Um, so I've not fully had a chance to play with that. Um, it's a set of over a dozen um, APIs for doing different things around open source. Um, and it looks quite interesting for, again, some public APIs that you can get interesting information around things. Um, it's welcome to Nginx. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's definitely been a bit of instability over time. Um, it's definitely a bit of a best efforts so project. This is climate sustainability. Oh wow, this is so they're they're really working at um, like a n mass, so two million repositories. Should I should start up an Augur instance with enough bandwidth to do two million repositories? Uh, oh, this is a lot of there's a lot here. I'm not sure. It's an interesting, it's an interesting platform. Literally making me think about what I'm actually interested in. Commits. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't really, this is interesting to me. Because, for example, we have about 60,000 repositories on the public Augur instance. And well, I guess it's not true that we have, it's, we don't have, we have, uh, Augur's commits table is actually commit files. Uh, so we have like 260 million on the public instance, but those are commit files, not commits. So I guess this sort of makes sense. Oh, this is interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Now I have to figure out how to stop sharing that. Let me get back to my window. Um, also uh, new on the call, uh, I don't know, Victor, if you want to introduce yourself or just kind of hanging out. Oh, sorry, yeah, uh, I'm I'm here just to listen. I, I I've been joining some of the chaos meetings, so and yeah, the the, the anger, the the auger, the, the application came up multiple times. So I'm just here to uh, just to guess, listen, and see what what is about. All right, great. Um, and if you want to know more about it, uh, just ping me in Slack, and I can give you the overview, like in more depth. Same for you, Jamie. Um, you know, it, obviously this meeting, so the first Augur meeting, I went way, way deep into technical depth and Dawn Foster, our chief data scientist was on the project and she's like, yeah, you can't go that technically deep and expect people to ever come back to the meeting. <laughs> so I'm trying to <laughs> raise it up a level. Um, Dawn was right. I'm mean, like, I know, I knew this at the time, but <clears throat> I was still unsure of how to facilitate it. So I I definitely welcome any feedback on the utility of the topics that we're covering. Um, and nobody should feel like they have to raise their hand. So welcome, Victor. Um, does anyone else have any topics they want to bring up? Or um, would you like to, I can, if not, I can cover the um, results of our software survey um, up to this point. So, uh, all right, just share my screen here. 
And this is the PDF uh, of the survey. And so these are these key takeaways are basically that installing is the biggest challenge for all KS software and finding data and drawing insights is also a challenge. So uh, Augur is a relational database with a schema that has relationships and um, part of its platform enables you to see how complete your data collection is compared to what's on a site, a hosting platform. Uh, Grimoire Lab has really great software also, but it's stored in an open search database. And so searching it requires a different set of skills, really. Um, and there's a pretty tight Kibana dependency for front end stuff. Um, and Ospos continue to use both tools. It was a very small sample. Uh, 31 people, 26 have used the, the tools. Um, we had uh, for-profit companies as our principal response, uh, demographic, some academic. Um, do you work in an open source program office? Yes, three quarters, no, the rest of them. Good government, nonprofit, or none of the above. Um, contributor demographics, um, have you contributed to the chaos project? Uh, about half the people had, uh, another sixth had previously, and about a third had never contributed. Oh, yes, more pages. In terms of tool usage of people who took the survey, there were um, 23 who are currently using, or 23 who have used or tried to use Grimoire Lab, and 16 who have used or tried to use Augur. And well, wait, that's more than the 31 people who answered the survey. Yes, because many people have tried both. Um, how long people have been using it. Um, Ospos, Augur only, there were five. Grimoire Lab only, there were six. Both, there were, I'm going to say eight. Um, Non-Ospo, uh, five using Grimoire Lab, and three using both. Um, Challenges for using chaos tools. So this would bunch Augur and Grimoire Lab together. Installing, configuring, maintaining, finding data. I think it's fair to say that finding data is a challenge in any chaos tool. Um, if you're familiar with relational structures, then you're more likely to be able to find what you're looking for in Augur. If you're familiar with open search and how it might be structured, then you'd probably be more effective finding the data in that. Grimoire Lab, um, yeah, yeah. self-hosting has become really difficult. That's why we have the public access version of Augur. Um, yeah, uh, overwhelming data, which that's actually why Don's role exists because we know that on the Chaos Project, we've defined 80 some metrics and they do include overwhelming data And uh, these are other challenges. So Compass is a project that's uh, led out of China by Huawei. And since it's uh, led out of China, there are some folks who don't understand it quite yet. Nonetheless, we're going to stand up a, uh, a Compass instance in uh, Europe in 2024 and continue to develop the public Augur instance. Compass does use a bit of Grimoire Lab, but it's substantially more um, complex. Uh, and and I don't know what's the word. It's built to host, uh, so it has messaging queues and things like that that don't exist in regular Gamora Lab. Uh, people love the community. Twenty six people answered the survey. Uh, additional details. You can access the raw data. Um, for me, the one of the takeaways is like I said at the very beginning that. Um, Augur is significantly faster than the other tools that are in the chaos project. Um, I can, I can get data and it's a, it's at that like thousand repo threshold where it really starts to separate itself. Um, and that's, that's just because we've built it that way. And Andrew is one of the people who did build it that way. So thank you, Andrew. Um, this is a lot of information that you're free to scan on your own time. And I guess more data available. 
So you can go to these links. So if you want to understand uh, the survey or poke around what other people who can who participated in the survey have to say, uh, you have that opportunity uh, here. The, the implications for Augur is we are we are striving right now to get a containerized version of Augur up. Um, one of our maintainers has developed a, v, a visual installer for Augur. And both that and the Docker container are sort of held up by a problem we're having with um, RabbitMQ and getting a container for RabbitMQ to run. So hopefully that we punch through that little obstacle in the next several weeks. And if anybody is really good with RabbitMQ, I'd welcome your help. So um, I think the Augur has, uh, in terms of features and what it does, we've kind of been driven significantly by what people want. So if somebody starts to use Augur and asks for things, they tend to get more of our time and attention um, so that that works out for them. So yeah, that's, I guess, all I have to say about that. Any other thoughts or comments? Uh, just uh, when I did attend the uh, Chaos Matrix meeting before. Yeah, and, uh, the metric and model so, meeting. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, when we're talking about Augur, Augur um, what, one, uh, I don't know if it's possible or not, uh, is within the, the CNCF community, uh, there's a need to sometimes evaluate uh, the uh, maturity model, uh, maturity of a of a project. So when they become uh, like sandbox uh, and, and incubating projects, and then eventually to graduation project, um, can Augur be used to automate that evaluation process? Yeah, de depending on um, what it is you're trying to evaluate. Um, so. Uh, I don't know what the CNCF is doing to evaluate maturity. I know that maturity is a is a question that uh, that's that always exists. Um, I just want to bring up uh, that's an old version, I think. Oh no. Runbook maturity check. No, maybe this is like a more. All right. Yeah, this is a, uh, I think I'm just going to put this in the notes and I'll put it in chat as well. Okay. Jimmy's going to catch up on the recording. Thank you. So this spreadsheet, um, which uh, you're seeing, right? Oh, wait a minute. You're not seeing it. Let me bring it over. So this spreadsheet um, uh, basically is looking at the artifacts in, and this was presented at the Open Source Program Office Chaos meeting earlier today. Um, it's looking at the files contained in a repository and using the contents of those files to categorize the maturity of a project. And a lot of people on that call thought this was a pretty helpful um way of way of assessing project maturity because as a project gets more mature, mature things like the structure the governance the working in public become more surfaced and um that's this has been led by the um the digital infrastructure group of uh, health and human services uh for and the group specifically is looking at medicaid and medicare in the U.S. government and how they've opened, how their open source program office is functioning, and so this are this is derived basically from the digital services of the U.S. government, um, and this is one maturity model that I've seen out there. Um, for CNCF, yeah, I said, I, I or probably you were, used the wrong word. It was not maturity for the for the um, the, the uh, maturity model for the CNCF. It's a for it's a graduation criteria, I would say, for for a project. Yeah. Um, so I I shared one document. Um, basically, this is the kind of oh. 
I, yeah, I see that. It, yeah. So so basically, uh, if a project joins, what's the criteria to measure a uh, project when it goes to the you know uh, more mature? I mean, graduation from 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 joining the CNCF community to being a so-called graduated project. This is a um, document uh, I created to uh, kind of template uh, using the, the criteria that, that uh, the CNCF uh, TOC has, uh, the, the um, community has created. Um, so one thing I've noticed is uh, right now the uh, evaluation process is a manual. I believe they're working on some automation, but the problem is after a project graduated, then so so like, like graduate meaning they've already gone through all the process and it's ready to be used, right? But after that, there's no more um, criteria because there's a manual process. There's no more evaluation after project get um, graduated, meaning yeah. if the project no longer um, is being worked on and people because of graduated, people sometimes don't care anymore. That even yeah. if graduated, it no longer become kind of a useful project anymore. So just curious, is there, yeah, is it, is auger uh, is it is it process possible to create kind of a automated process to uh, evaluate project throughout the life cycle of the project on the GitHub? So, uh, just at a high level, looking at what's here, um, the, the scope and goals. That's something that I think requires some subjective analysis. Um, unless until in, or unless and until there is a standard file in a project for stating scope and goals, um, I don't see how that could be automated because there are so many different ways that projects express scope and goals. Um, but for the second item, um, which is uh, community development grow and growth is ongoing. I think like tools like Augur are pretty good at getting all of the data that you could possibly ever want to understand how the community is growing, how the software is being maintained, if there are any parts of the software that have not been maintained for a long time. So Augur could automate this piece, which is, I think, perhaps the piece that, be, well, I think it's what you probably most want to monitor after graduation, because this is going to be a trailing indicator of any kind of collapse in terms of the growth and development of a project and community. Like we'll see the number of maintainers or contributors decline. We'll see issues and pull requests decline. Um, and that could be an indication of maturity, but it could also be an indication of the project staling out. So um, we can definitely help automate the things that are under this bucket. Um, in terms of project governance, I mean, that is, again, a, a pretty subjective thing. Uh, now, if you're looking at licenses, codes of conduct, decision-making, so parts of this, the maintainer structure, the code of conduct, the DCO and licenses, uh, and maintainers even. So I think parts of this could actually be derived from a repository. Uh, parts of it, I think, are going to have to be evaluated uh, for example, you know, governance can be used in a lot of different ways. Governance can go bad and it won't be visible in the repository. I'm sure you've seen that, Victor. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like there's nothing else. To, there's nothing really that signals governance going sideways. It just does. Um, and long term planning exists that. Um, uh, I don't know other than um, requiring like a roadmap dot markdown file somewhere in the project. I don't know how we would assess this. Like, I think we'd have to create some structure like we had with, like we have on the chaos project with the DEI.MD um, where projects can explicitly state their roadmaps in some standard format. Um, then we would be able to scan it. But right now I don't know that this is scannable. Be honest with you. Yeah. So, so uh, as I said, some of the information may only be um, useful during the the um, the when it's being going through the the different level of uh, mat uh, yeah. mature to the to the um, graduation. But right. after it's graduated, 
it's probably no longer necessary to have a like a full uh, because we know it's been successful so we know the government government model works yeah. and uh, the, the, the 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 long-term goal was already met because the project was a success because it graduated mainly yeah. mainly is um like what matrix is, is even relevant that long-term wise like 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 say if a project graduated 10 years ago um but if uh, if a new open source project come along and say okay well this this is cool this, this project seems to be what we need um but yeah. they don't know whether this, this project has been did anyone even maintaining this project for the last 10 years um so, so sort of a just health indicator of a graduate project i feel that's not it's kind of a something that's not been uh worked on uh at all well i mean i think like as i look through this the and adoption is tricky as well because there are so many different ways that projects get distributed. It's a bit hard to specify what adoption even means. Like they struggle with this on Fedora um, a lot, and that's a widely distributed project. But people download the ISO one time and install it n times on computers, so it's difficult to know how much it's actually used. But this this number five. Uh, development ongoing all those metrics there are easily discerned from chaos software and number uh, two uh, sorry to interrupt that the, the dev, dev stat is that i don't know where that stats come from actually that website that, that dev stats um... dev stats .io is a kubernetes um project i hadn't even been aware that um dev stats was being used for anything but kubernetes but it looks like uh it looks like it is so de yeah, DevStats came out of Kubernetes and it looks like, uh, and it's maintained by one person. So, I mean, if <laughs> there's a bit of risk on that project, but it does provide some useful stats. I would say Augur and 8 not um, have a much stronger support base. Um, although I don't think the CNCF is gonna let DevStats die either, so. So, um, so basically, both Stabstat and Augur uh, get information from GitHub, uh, but yeah. but but does it depend? Of course, Augur doesn't depend on Devstat. No, Augur doesn't use Devstats at all. Um, I have no knowledge of how Devstats works, though. I think it is an open source project. I think it's actually open sourced under Kubernetes. It's not. I was wrong about that. But I'm sure if I search GitHub for DevStats, I'll find it. CNCF DevStats Archive. Interesting. CNCF DevStats. So yeah, here's the DevStats repo. It is under CNCF now. As recently as a year ago, which is probably the last time I checked, it was directly part of the Kubernetes project. And the only place I saw it was Kubernetes. So it's great that uh, CNCF has this. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot of information on DevStats for sure. I think um, oh, it's uh, it's DevStats dot something. Maybe it's DevStats dot No, it's K8. Uh, that was K8. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is your, I don't know if you've seen this before. This is your basic dev stats dashboard. And we are yeah. past time, by the way. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in here that you can, you can dig into. Um, it's a stats nerd's dream, but it also, is, you know, there's a lot here. I'll just say that. New and episodic PR contributors. And looks like you can, any Kubernetes project can be looked at on this one. So, oh, so, so I guess my question about Augur is, does it um, do any statistics like DevStats? 
it it does a lot of statistics like dev stats it does a lot of uh more specific statistics and uh if you look at metrics.chaos.io or and, and really that's where i would direct you right now um you're gonna see a, a lot of i would characterize them as more selective metrics so what i think i'm seeing when i look at kubernetes is a lot of raw data like the default period is 28 days so um oh no it's well it says 28 day period 28 days ma i don't know what that means 28 days ma all right all okay so it's every 28 days they're taking account um the OSS Aspen 8 knot project, which is what's at metrics.ks.io, uh, doesn't window it that way. Um, so it uh, you have every single pull request, every single pull request comment. Um, there's much richer data, and I think data that you can manipulate to your own desires more easily. Um, but I'm not as familiar with um, dev stats. So depending on your objectives, everything you need might be in dev stats. I just don't know. I just feel like th there's a lot of good work and done in the chaos uh, community about matrix, um, but those matrix may not be available, uh, not even in the GitHub itself. So um, be no. good to add to those to the to, to the to the to be available to actually measure the the um the product um i don't know how, how to call it is, is it still considered maturity but yeah just a basic a, a status of a project uh, in in the, in the in the actual uh, projects like dncf projects yeah like um if uh i don't if there was a way to get like, um, like I see the graduated projects, um, the incubating projects, um, the sandbox projects, a lot of sandbox projects. Um, if that's this, actually if an, the, another, sorry, that's another area that's in um, some, for example, some of the project sandbox projects there stay there forever. So there's a discussion about uh, should they be removed, kind of archived, because they, they're not moving up, so they should be gone, should be removed. But somebody said, no, actually, and even if they're sandbox, some project is still being used. So what should be the criteria to to leave them there? Uh, I, I know it's being discussed in the CNCF as well, but I feel um, the, the way chaos has been defined, it's more kind of systematic when it comes to matrix. So I'm just curious why there's no doesn't seems to be a lot. I know, I know um, Don is on in both community, but in general, I don't see a lot of the collaboration between the CNCF and Chaos for some reason. Um, I mean, I think CNCF is a pretty large uh, foundation. Like it's an entire foundation within the Linux Foundation. So I would say the resources that CNCF gets from the Linux Foundation are substantially more than what Chaos gets. And so... And that the pro and they're actually hosting all of these projects, right? Chaos is one project inside the Linux Foundation that facilitates the development of standard metrics and software to support that. Um, but so I think we could be helpful. We, we would be. I mean, I think Chaos as a project would be happy to collaborate with the CNCF. And I think CNCF is so gigantic that the kinds of metrics that they're even able to digest might be these these high level metrics that are available in dev stats. Like that might be all you can digest about a CNCF project when you're trying to make sense of it. Um, that's my, I mean, I, I don't know that. I'm just suggesting that's a possibility. Like, I think there's a friendly, there's a friendly relationship between CNCF and chaos. I, you know, got a lot of friends and colleagues that are part of different CNCF projects. Um, so I, I think it's just a case of the scope of what CNCF is, which is, again, it's a foundation within the Linux foundation, like it's its own foundation. That's a that's a much bigger footprint on Earth than the Chaos Project. And so, I mean, if they, if they learn from us, and I suspect they do, that's good. 
Um, if, if it's helpful to use uh, chaos tools, uh, we're all about helping to make that happen. But it, you know, it would have to come out of the the CNCF. Like someone like you would have to say, yeah, I think we can make use of this. Why don't we do a pilot with some of these sandbox projects? Um, and I'd be happy to kick that off with you. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not <laughs> in the in the TOC either. So, but uh, but yeah, I, I I've been uh, just wondering. There does seems to be a lot of uh, should be some synergy there, but I'm not sure how it's going to happen. But uh, I, that's why I'm here to learn what Augur is about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it's as simple as if if you threw a bunch of sandbox projects at me, like, okay, here's a project and all the repositories that are part of it. You know, pick pick a dozen, and we're ten minutes over right now, so I need to cut this off. But um, just set, if you send them to me in Slack, I'll put them in an instance of uh, Augur and uh, help you look around. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. I need to uh, call this to a close because I let it go 10 minutes over. I'm not supposed to do that. So sorry. Somebody's got to somebody else besides me needs to keep time next time. Um, I'll talk with you all soon. Thanks for participating. Okay. Bye. Bye.